Hey everyone, this is Ross. We're super excited today because in today's video, we're going to be designing a garden for you guys from scratch, um, completely from nothing, because this spring I'm joining a community garden um, that's pretty close to my house. It's going to be a 30 by 30 plot. This is a picture here of what a plot looks like. Uh, this is a double plot um, that... <clears throat> my best friend's mom takes care of um, and it's a funny story my I have two best friends that I went to college with played tennis with in college um, the both of their moms live in the area and they both take care of a plot here um, so it's kind of funny um, I've been there a couple of times to sort of help out but also to see how everything's you know what it's like um, it's a pretty cool community, um, especially because I'm going to be spending time with my best friend's moms, right? <laughs> um, no, I think it'll be nice a nice change from kind of gardening and growing by myself mostly to now ha being a part of a community. I think communities are great. That's the biggest reason why I have this YouTube channel is uh, for the community aspect of it. So. Um, I think that's going to be great. Um, the reason why we are doing this, though, is it's a lot of land. Um, it's a 30 by 30 plot that I'm going to have, 30 feet, by the way. Um, that's a lot of space. You know, um, I have had a lot of freedom, at least here in my parents' house, to um, plant and grow almost anything I wanted. Um, you know, I've had a lot of freedom to take up their land. Um, but because it is their land, it's um, sort of limiting in that I just always every year sort of can't grow certain things or have to grow them in a certain way so that they don't take up a whole lot of space. Um, my At least my objective with the community garden is that I'm going to be as maintenance, make it as maintenance free as possible, uh, make it in a way that... <clears throat> Because I'm not going to be there very often, as close as it is to my house, um, I don't intend to really be there all that much. There is going to be a lot of weeds. Um, you can tell what they end up doing here with this plot every year is that they they actually um, take everything down, and then they I guess they get a tractor or something to really just turn the soil um, over and over and kind of flatten the whole thing out again and. Um, just incorporate everything that was in the garden bed back into the soil um, so it's really tilling and by tilling you are getting a lot of weeds that are now going to pop up uh, because you disturb the soil and I don't expect it also to be like the most productive plot because of that reason um, because it was tilled every year um, because it's probably not the most nutritious soil um, you know I don't really know how well this thing is taken care of um, I don't think it's an organic plot I think people can do pretty much whatever they want there are some rules in here and there but it's not gonna be like growing vegetables at my house where I have a hundred percent control over everything um, my main goal here is to kind of get as much food in here as possible at least that I'm gonna eat and I'm gonna process in some way um, or store I think that's gonna be a big thing here with this plot is I'm gonna grow a lot of crops for storage um, over the winter time so I'm gonna grow a lot of like onions and potatoes uh, we'll get into what I'm gonna grow and all that in a second um, but I guess you know it's it's really just meant to be like a, a maintenance free thing and I'm gonna essentially cover the whole thing with straw I'm gonna go um, get myself some straw it's it's pretty affordable in terms of the surface area that it covers and how it's gonna prevent a lot of these weeds from popping up I could get myself some cardboard and fill in the the rows at least the walking paths with cardboard and then put down the straw and uh, that would really keep the weeds down and that's going to really eliminate a lot of my maintenance, a lot of my worries. And even most of my crops, I want to cover them with some sort of mulch. I don't want to have the soil exposed like you see here. 
What I am going to do in um, for certain crops, and we'll talk about that, I guess, as we go, is that I'm going to, I am going to put down some compost. Um, so it is sort of a net investment that goes into this every year in terms of material, you know, compost, straw. Um, what I am going to do, and you can see there's a fence around the whole thing, is that you need to get yourself uh, posts that you can put in the ground. And they should be wooden posts. They can't be anything that's non-biodegradable. Um, so I can't use some like steel posts that I've been using here. You know, guys like the EMT poles um, and the T posts. I can't use them, unfortunately. That really stinks. Um, but I, I do have some bamboo wooden stakes that are pretty heavy duty. We're going to do some heavier pruning on some of my trees outside. I'm going to take the wood from that and use that as stakes. Um, so we should have some pretty decent, um, <clears throat> at least we can, we have to have a, a decent upfront material that has to go into this. And then the other thing I need to go around the entire property or the entire plot is a deer fencing because uh, there is deer. This is in a park, um, so it's definitely quite exposed. And I figure I probably just need like two of these um, for a total of $30 there. Um, I'll have to probably get myself some, maybe one or two, a couple more stakes. Yeah, the stakes are free. I have that covered. Um, I have to get myself some compost, probably a few bags here and there of compost, maybe, I don't know, maybe $30 worth of compost plus, you know, about $60 worth of straw. Um, and then I have to pay the fee of like 30, I think it's like 25 to 35 dollars, I can't remember exactly. So it's probably gonna cost me, if I, if I had to guess, somewhere around 150 dollars, which is really not that much. And for the amount of land and the amount of time that's uh, I'm gonna put into this, the amount of food I'm gonna get out of this, I think it's well worth it. Um, 150 dollars is nothing. So um, at least in terms of having this you know ability to do this guys I mean $150 is a lot of money to certain people but um, it's definitely uh, I think well worth the the investment so that's what we're gonna do um, and that's how it's all gonna work um, I have a plot here that we created in Excel but this is in Google Drive so this is my spreadsheet and you guys can find this spreadsheet in every video I've ever done in the description um, this links to everything that pretty much I keep track of for my own personal use, like our flavor profiles, um, what varieties I really highly respect, my keeper list, you know, fig synonyms, hardy figs, a lot of fig related information, how many um, different fruit trees and whatnot that I'm growing to keep track of the source, the variety, um, you know, where I got it, how it's planted, different data points about all that. The same thing with my fig list. But then also my garden plans. And I think this is a really important point to make about growing um, a garden at all is that you should be planning your garden quite a bit. If you're not gonna plan your garden, um, you're really gonna kinda shoot yourself in the foot, especially when it comes to the spring and getting everything organized and, and not having the spring take over your entire life um, and really rushing to get things in the ground. And um, this just makes everything so, so simple. So whether you do this in Excel or, or Google Drive or, or not, it doesn't matter. You should be planning a garden in some format like this. And how I like to do it is that each box on the spreadsheet here represents a square foot so this is a square foot that's a square foot that's a square foot etc so um, it's a 30 by 30 plot I measure I made sure I measured this out here's 30 cells um, lengthwise and widthwise then we have the fence that goes around which is this black part here and I don't want to grow all the way up against the fence so I figure I'll give myself a uh, a square foot there, um, a nice little footpath, and then um, that takes away, that leaves us with basically all this room here to grow in. 
And then this section here is just the entrance to the plot, right? So uh, I gotta have an entrance somehow. <laughs> and then, yeah, like I said, the rest of this is where we're growing in. So it's sort of um, really 28 by 28. And there's gonna be footpaths in between here um, for sure. And that's just kind of how we're gonna design it. That's how it's all gonna work. Um, this little space here is just essentially for a walkway to get in. And, um, you know, as an example, if I wanted to create another plot or another row of something, I could just use this tool and merge all the cells here, put a border around it, <clears throat> and then I can label this with whatever I want. So let's kind of go through now some different things that I want to grow. Like if I wanted to grow, let's say, potatoes, I can sort of just type in here potatoes as an example um, and I think I can even rotate the text yeah there we go and I can center this vertically uh, I can make this a little bit bigger and then that way we know exactly what this is what is gonna go here and even the spacing of how where everything goes you know um, it's just so simple like this and I can even copy this and paste it here and that way I have another thing here if I wanted to do more potatoes it's just real simple real easy to do so um, yeah makes it makes a huge difference all right so what do I got in front of me here <clears throat> um, so another thing I didn't mention about the plot is that it's gonna be from sometime in April to uh, sometime in October um, and I don't think it's going to be very early in, in April. Um, our average last frost is May 1st. So I imagine probably sometime around April 15th, this will all be going on. Um, this will all be beginning. And for me, April 15th is just too late in the season to grow certain things. Um, because even April 15th, it's not necessarily warm. But if you were to plant something April 15th here, um, it's not gonna really have all that much time to mature before it gets warm. So things like my cool loving crops, like brassicas and lettuces, so things like that, I'm gonna be growing at my house here that I can put in the ground um, by March 15th. Even sooner, um, if I can get my cold frame together, I can start growing um, food even earlier than that um, to help warm up the soil that way. But I think um, March 15th is really a really great date to start here. Um, you could maybe, in the, on, a, on a good year, you could maybe start even uh, March 1st, depending on what it is. Um, but the ground needs to be loose, right? Ground doesn't need to, it shouldn't be frozen. And um, usually by March, we the ground doesn't really freeze too much at that point. Um, we will can get some frosts in March. Um, so you just have to protect certain things with row covers, whatever it is that you have. Um, if they're a little bit more tender seedlings, then it's not going to really hit them as hard. So um, it's not going to really make a difference if let's say March 15th there's a or March 20th or 25th or something there's a frost that comes in it's probably quite light I would imagine at that point even in April quite light and uh, it won't necessarily hurt anything too badly so um, for me I think it's a it's it's a no-brainer to sort of do that at the house that you know if I can't get this early start going here then I am pretty much forced to grow some vegetables at my house plus there's a convenience factor like things like arugula which I've got here I got like a thousand seeds probably less than that in this little guy but I've got a huge pack here that uh, I've opened this is four ounces of arugula and I've talked about arugula in the past this is just literally the best garden vegetable you can grow um, in terms of a lettuce I think this is it beats every single other lettuce for a salad by far I'm sorry if you don't agree with that um, we're not gonna agree on much 
um, I think that there's, um, it's just a really tender, um, pleasant to eat. It's got a nice bite to it. Um, if you've ever, if you've never grown a, arugula, you have to grow it. I'm sorry. It's really, really spectacular. So this is one that we're going to grow here and you can see all that in our garden plants here. We've got, you know, basically six square feet of arugula that we're going to have and that pretty much will get me a, like a salad almost every day for quite some time. Um, it's a pretty big harvest window. You keep cutting it and it keeps coming back and also stops it from from blooming. We've also got here some broccoli. I have two different types of broccoli. I think I have one that you do in the fall, one you do in the spring. Um, one is, uh, let's see, we have Waltham 29. And then I have a solstice broccoli. I think the solstice broccoli, uh, I think that the solstice one is the one for the fall, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe it's the reverse. But um, I also have fennel, which we'll do. A Zepha pheno fennel. Again, that's somewhere on this. Here we go, right here. I love my fennel. I love my broccoli. Um, broccoli is definitely better when you grow it yourself. Fennel is hard to find. And um, fennel is incredible. I love fennel, um, even bronze fennel, you can grow as a perennial and have it in an ornamental setting. And your bronze fennel will, will uh, put out some flower heads and you can harvest the, the, uh, the seeds at the end of the season. You have fennel seed fresh that you can, um, that's dry and you'll have it all year. Um, and you can do all kinds of nice things with fennel seed. I'm trying to make those breadsticks, you ever have those breadsticks guys? In Italy, they make these nice thin breadsticks with fennel in them, fennel seed. It's incredible. Um, I need to learn how to make that stuff. I also have some Asian greens here, and there's really very few Asian greens that I decided to grow um, this upcoming season. Really, it's, it's quite limited to um, basically bok choy. Um, there is some Chinese broccoli and things like that that I think is really valuable. Um, so I'm going to make two piles here. I also have a giant bag. This bag will last me a couple years, but um, this is sugar snappies. This is sugar and this is the number one garden vegetable that you can grow. Number one by far. Um, so this is what we're going to do is every year I grow them in the spring. I plant as many of these as I can. Um, somewhere in here is the, here it is right here. So the peas and beans. So once the peas finish, the string beans go in and I can have myself string beans um, right after that. And I, I may wanna move some of this stuff around. I may wanna say to myself, all right, well, I probably shouldn't grow the sugar snap peas at the plot, um, but I could grow string beans there, right? And instead of having string beans after these peas, I could do something else. Or um, I could just entirely ditch this idea, who knows? Um, I think it would be, because I have so much room at this plot, I could even just grow a bunch of pepper plants and forget about this. I could really move some things around, even these ground cherries. Um, I don't need to have peppers every day. Um, I mainly am going to grow peppers to preserve them in vinegar and olive oil. So this is definitely one thing I think we can just eliminate and I'm going to grow at the plot. The basil and oregano, I think this is great to have at your house very close to your home. The ground cherry I think is nice because it's like a nice snack that you can snack on any time. So I think I'm gonna keep that at the house um, for now. We'll see if I wanna change any of this around. Yeah, we've got some more Asian greens here. We've also got some turnips and turnips and beets and radishes. I am very highly considering trying them again um at this particular plot maybe i can get away with them um actually definitely the turnips 
Um, yeah, I should be able to plant almost all of this at the plot. Uh, beets may be a bit difficult. Um, I also really liked out of most of these Asian greens, the tat soy is really good. Um, this is one of them you I think you plant in the spring um, or in the fall. And this is a uh, really a nice green in the spring um, that uh, is a nice alternative to like, let's say broccoli, uh, but it's not exactly broccoli, but it's like a nice brassica, let's say that you can grow. Um, but you know what? I'm sort of on the fence about that. Who knows what I can do with that? Let's see. We have parsley here. Do we want to grow parsley again? Not too much of a fan. Komatsuna is another one that I think is really worth growing. Um, the Happy Rich from Johnny's. It's an F1 hybrid. This is a thing very similar to um, Broccoli Rob. And I also have Rapini here. I have different types of Chinese broccoli. It's all very similar. Um, the Suho I think is another good one. But I'm, I'm a bigger fan, I think, and, and uh, that dude, um, what's his name? The market gardener that goes from Connecticut or Maine, is it Maine all the way down to Florida? And he brings this red truck and he goes back and forth and he sells over there uh, in both places. I forget. Oh, Jim Kovaleski, but he grows Happy Rich and Suho. And uh, I want to find out which of those he likes better. I, there was a recent video I saw that I <clears throat> that he showed them again. There's also Swiss chard, and Swiss chard I don't think is really worth growing um, in a a plot format, like even an organized garden, because this stuff is just like a weed, man. This you could literally just scatter some seeds around my yard, even just plant them a little deep. And they're going to grow and they're going to be there all year. This is really almost perennial. Um, I mean, it's nuts. So I could, I'm could, i going to stick this around the yard in different places. So I'm going to have a different category, I guess, for that. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? We have a mescaline mix. I don't think we're going to mess with that. Um, I wasn't too impressed with that mix last year. We have Brussels sprouts, something we definitely want to do as well. All right, we're going to put that aside. So I have some things here, and I also have sunflowers. Oh. Yeah, I've got some sunflowers, and I've also got some Walla Walla sweet onion seeds, but these these onion seeds are not going to germinate, I would imagine. It's packed for 2019. However, I need to get myself um, new seed because the onion seeds only last a year. And I guess I could try these and see if they germinate because actually very soon, February 1st, you're supposed to start your onion seeds indoors so i should do that probably and then see if they sprout um i've always wanted to have sunflowers and different things around the yard but i never could find space for them so maybe i should grow some sunflowers yeah that's that's a good one probably it's figure out how to get these in the ground um now I wonder if you have to start if you should start them indoors, probably. Yeah, you should probably definitely start these indoors. So I'll think about doing that. Um, now here's some more Walla Walla onion seeds. These are old. This is from 2018. I guess I could try these as well. So I have uh, one thing I do want to grow for sure at the plot. Is corn. That's a absolute must. Um, here's pak choy and this is uh, 
soy sum, which I wasn't too impressed with actually. Um, so I guess the pak choy is pretty much a good one to grow here, but this pak choy is a summer thing. Um, so I have to put this with my summer crops. It, believe it or not, the pak choy and different bok choy varieties will bolt if it's too cold, which is kind of nuts. You would think it would be the opposite, right? Things bolt when it's too warm. Not that. <laughs> um, so I also have corn, as I was getting to. And this corn here... I mean, I would like to grow all these different things I mentioned before I get into the corn, like cabbage and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and Chinese broccoli and rapini, broccoli rob and all that. But they have to be grown here. There's no other way because I have to get them in the ground. I have to start them indoors. Then I have to get them in the ground. Um, basically... Uh, Bias by March fifteenth, as, as I was as I was saying. So it's one of them things that if you don't you don't get that right, that timing right, it's just not going to work. And um, it was kind of unfortunate because that's just sort of how it is. Um, I have different types of Swiss chard here, by the way: perpetual spinach, the Verde de Taglio, which I really love, and I have the neon lights. Swiss chard that we're gonna put around the yard. Um, I'm also gonna do kale this year if I have kale. Um, if I have kale seeds left, I also have blooms down long-standing spinach. But um, my personal opinion is that arugula is king, and um, I think spinach is uh, it's easy to get at the store. You know, um, I guess arugula is easy to get at the store too, but I don't know. I feel like my arugula is just far superior to what you get at the store as well. Um, whereas baby spinach at the store just seems to be... Eh, it seems to be just as good as the stuff you grow at home. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm off on that. I also have basil seeds here we get to grow in the, uh, in the summer. All right, so that's a summer thing, summer thing. All right, we have spaghetti squash here. All right, so we've got a bunch more sets of seeds here, and then we'll have an idea of what we should grow in this plot. Um, spaghetti squash I can put back in this thing, but this is all heat-loving crops. So, all right. We have corn, and I have two different types of corn at least. I have Luther Hill, and I have the Golden Bantam 12-row corn. And this is one that I cannot for the life of me get to work. I'm basically doing this plot. This is one big part of the plot right here. If I, in this plot, can't get corn to work, then I'll be very disappointed. I think I've just had such a small area to grow in and corn needs a bigger space that you just won't be able to successfully grow corn um, in a smaller area. It just doesn't get pollinated right. I don't know what it is. It just doesn't work out. Um, maybe it's too heavy of a feeder. Maybe I'm not feeding it. Maybe I should get myself a hybrid and forget about these heirlooms. You know, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a strange crop. And it's been very elusive for years, and I don't know exactly what to do. Um, so I'm going to put that over here for now. If anyone has any tips on corn, please let me know. It's been through these struggles that I've been going through. We did a video on growing corn, and every time it's just been like a disappointing year, every single season. So I think we're going to somehow get ourselves this little mix of things here we have um, we're gonna put this in the plot right now is we have cylindra beets and this one is 
It's supposed to be a pretty good one. I know there's a lot of different beats out there. This one may have an issue. Um, it says here, starting two to four weeks before last frost in spring. So if I get them in the ground, I guess April 15th, we may have a successful beet crop. We may not. And I think that could be a big issue here. Maybe I should start them indoors. Um, and that would, I think, give me a big jump on the season with these and I can get myself some beets. We also have French breakfast radishes. Um, this is a wonderful radish. This thing withstands everything. I can grow this all year. Um, it's also extremely tasty. Um, it's incredible. Uh, just a step down, I think, from the breakfast radish is the Oasis turnip or the Hakurai turnip. And this is a turnip that's white and tastes a lot like radishes. Uh, people call them snow apples. They're quite sweet. And for me, I actually don't mind eating turnips, these, these turnips and the radishes fresh. But these three things here that I just mentioned, they're going to be grown, I think, to be processed in some way. Um, I would like to pickle radishes, pickle beets, pickle the uh, turnips, pickle all that. Um, and then also I can have my carrots, mocum carrots. There's a lot of room for this. Essentially what I'll have to do for this stuff here is I'm going to have to plant them all um, in a in compost. I can't won't be able to direct seed all of them, but I will need them to grow in compost. And I should also uh, put down just a thin layer of compost so I can direct seed into that. It's going to make it so much easier to direct seed into that. Um, the moisture is going to be there. I'm going to have good germination. Then on top of that, we'll go the probably some straw. At a certain point in the season, I think I have to cover that bed with straw. And um, so that one will do as like a maybe even a one foot square, uh, a one square foot row somewhere in here. Um, we'll do it against the edge, I guess. And we're going to do beets. Carrots, turnips, radishes. And uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, that works. Okay. So we'll do a 36. Okay, that's too big. All right, so that'll be our row right there of those different crops. I don't need a whole lot of growing space for this. I don't need to have a ton of this stuff. I mean, a giant row of, I guess this essentially would be giving me, if this is 30 square foot divided by four, you know, you're looking at um, a pretty decent amount of space for each of these different things. Um, Maybe I should double that up. Um, yeah. Um, it's basically seven and a half square feet per 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 crop. But I could double this if I wanted. And then that would give me 15 square feet per and, but I don't necessarily, I want to do like one big harvest as well of this stuff. I don't want to do, I think a succession planting. So I guess we can do two rows of one here. And I can plant them pretty much next to each other. Um, so we'll do two of these. And then one of them will just be B 
beets and carrots, and the other one will be turnips and radishes. And that'll be 15 square feet for each one. That'll give me a plenty of different, um, plenty of food that I can process. I can make many jars of this preserved pickled stuff here. And uh, yeah, who knows? I may even just need, I probably don't even need this much. Maybe I should even go, I should just stick to the original plan and do the whole row with those four things in it. We'll see how I, uh, what else I have here. Okay. Um, all right. Excuse me, guys. All right, so the corn, I guess we can find just we can kind of just throw this in here somewhere. But the corn, I don't think I wanted a giant row of it. I'd rather do it in like a square fashion. Sort of for appearances. Um but maybe I should do them in rows. Maybe I should do four, at least, I think they say at least do four rows of them. So we can either do four rows of corn or we can kind of just do a giant square of it. And I think I'd rather do a square. So let's just say, hmm. Okay, so this can be a bed here of something. And then this could be a bed here of something. Um, this one I think we'll just make of onions, walla walla onions, as we talked about. Okay. And then you fill this in, and then in the middle, is going to be corn. I guess we can just, we can always change this up, but let's just say this is our corn right here. So that's gonna be entirely corn. And I don't know exactly how many plants this is gonna be, but um, it'll be fine because we can always adjust if we need to. This one will do 96, center that out. And I think I like the idea just of having this giant like, square of corn in the middle of the plot because then you kind of get this different view of the, of the uh, plot when you go around the corn. You know, you're kind of sectioning off different things and like in an artistic way, it has some nice value to it, but it also takes away some like the view of the entire plot. So um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, it's not a great idea, but I think it's an interesting way to to like visualize how the food will be grown. Um, all right, so and we can like I guess just kind of plant sunflowers in random places. But we got our onions figured out. We got our potatoes. This is, by the way, these potatoes. I may want to even go more than this. I'm not entirely sure, but this seems like a lot. You know, this is 60 square feet about, well, actually it's less now that I mentioned, because I forgot about the edges of the, of the plot. But um, let's just say for argument's sake, it's 30. Um, well, it's basically 26 square feet. And then this potato bed here is then even less than that, um, 24 square feet of potatoes. So 24 square feet of potatoes gets me 24 potato plants. And then this is 26 onion 
Um, this gets me a crap ton of onions. I mean, this is probably too many now that I think about it because the way that I'm going to be planting my onions is multi-sown, the way that Charles Dowding does it. Um, but really, should I be worried too much about space? I, I like growing them as multi-sown onions. So the multi-sown thing, you grow about, I think it's uh, three to five onions per hole, and then you space out that appropriately. Um, so in a two foot wide bed, um, you could do, let's say, at least four plantings in the entire width. You can maybe get away with five. So all the way up and down that row is going to be four onion plants, multi-sown. But within each onion hole is then going to be, yeah, that's exactly how that works, I think. I think I did that last year with... Uh, but it was more like three. It was more like a three foot wide bed. I have to look at my video last year, but um, yeah, the spacing on that. There's gonna be a lot of onions in that thing, and my goal is to cure them and store them um, for the winter time and have basically onions all year round. Um, same thing with these potatoes. So. I may want to limit the onions and go more into potatoes because I ordered two pounds. I'm not sorry, two pounds. I ordered 20 pounds of Yukon Gold potatoes. That's a lot. I got them really cheap. Um, uh, well, you know, I hope the source works out. I think I may end up, even though it's 20 pounds, I may end up only using 10 because I, I might be very selective with the size of the seed potato. I want to plant the whole potato. I don't want to plant uh, one or two eyes in a hole. Um, I'd rather plant the entire potato, the biggest potato I can find, plant that in the ground, and do that one every square foot. So this would be actually 48, now that I think about it. This is 48 square feet, right? Yeah, and then this is uh, not 26, but double that, so 52 square feet. Um, yeah, that's a lot of onions, guys. Holy crap, I don't eat that much onions, I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, I might not even need all this. Uh, I, this plot in itself is huge. Uh, what I would like to do up here is sort of like half zucchini. Is this half of that? I think that's about half, right guys? This will just be zucchini. And I'm going to do... Um, the patty pan squash I think or maybe I should just type in patty pan eh, zucchini we'll just do different types of zucchini is that how you spell zucchini I think I just screwed that up guys all right um and I don't even think I need this much room you know one two three four five six seven eight yeah so I only really need about four zucchini plants uh, that's a lot of zucchini for those of you who have never grown zucchini that's a lot um, so that'll be one thing I do have some seeds let's let's open these up here and get some more ideas this I have a whole thing that I keep my seeds in here I never get rid of the envelope all right All right. That didn't sound good. All right, so what are we gonna grow in these heat-loving crops? Got a lot of random stuff here, I have to say. I got my string beans. 
Um, yeah, these are my string beans, I believe. These are my French beans that I saved, it looks like, but they look like snap peas. I don't know what these are. <laughs> I should have labeled it. They, they look, the bean itself looks like a sugar snap pea. Yeah, yeah, that's what these are. Yeah, I think I saved myself some beans or peas so we can grow these, but then again, we have a spot for that in our, um, our garden at home. Here's our string beans. The Kalima bean, a big fan of the Kalima bean. Here's more corn. Um, we'll have to look into the corn. Mizuna. I am a big fan of Mizuna, guys, and it does last all year, pretty much all year. Um, my big thing with that is that I just like arugula better. It's plain and simple, but Mizuna has its place, man. Um, it's got a nice texture to it. I just think it's not as good. Um, this is like the alternative in the heat to arugula. So if you want arugula all year, I think this is a good choice to grow this one in the summer. And we can keep that one for summer purposes. All right, so I got the orange banana tomato. This is the best paste tomato. I'm, I'm pretty darn sure about that. Um, it makes incredible sauce, guys. I made some really not so very flavorful sauce last year, and I think it can be directly attributed to the orange banana tomato. Um, and you can see the tomato varieties here that I'm growing. I've trialed quite a bit. Here's black cherry. This is the best cherry tomato I've ever had by far because the texture is very meaty, a lot like a a, a big beefsteak tomato that's meaty, but it's in a bite-sized cherry tomato form. We have the garden peach tomato. This one I've always I wanted to try again because I, I, I didn't get even to taste that one. But um, I'm not even going to bother, I think. I do enjoy green zebra. Black crim I enjoyed. The alpaca didn't do well at all. Blonde, Blonde kopschkin is a, an incredible tomato. It also, it's called Eadley. And it puts out more tomatoes than any tomato I've ever seen. It has the most incredible quality to it in terms of the hang ability on the vine. Um... It's a nuts, it's an incredible tomato. I just think black cherry is far superior. Green Giant, I wasn't too big of a fan of. The Black Beauty is very flavorful. Um, I didn't decide to grow that one again, huh? And you know what? I just caught, I sort of limited it. The Green Doctors wasn't that good. The reason I really limited my tomatoes. Um, and said, you know, enough's enough, is that I found just the best tomatoes I think I could find. You know, I'm not going to do this like I'm doing my figs. You know, my figs are, I'll trial them and keep going as long as I can. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's really important, I think, to pick your battles. <laughs> like, you know, I've got all these different fig varieties why should i do the same thing with tomatoes you know um i'm more of the opinion i don't love the tomato as much as i do figs so i'm like all right well i'll go crazy for the figs but the tomato i'm going to pick the ones that are the best and i'm going to stick with that and that's it um so yeah that's it the eggplant here we got to find a home for these eggplants i have ping tongue that we're, we're going to want to do the melons are a big question for me um, because there is going to be all kinds of pests at this plot. 
and I don't know if I can get away with melons there because everyone, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going to be growing cucumbers and maybe if they are growing cucumbers then I can get away with it because then they'll be attracted to the cucumber. Um, I'm not sure. I don't want to give up on the melon at least there but I'm more of the mindset that I don't necessarily need to grow it um, there. It would be nice because it has such a, it's a big wide open area and that was kind of the big goal with this giant area here is to get this filled in with melons, this whole thing and even kind of going into the corn would be kind of filled with melons. You know, that was my big goal and um, I just don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer as to what I'm going to do. I think I need to really think about that. But it would be nice, and I think it is a very good idea to fill in this these missing areas here with melons because I would. That's like a big goal of mine with this whole plot. Um, we're not going to grow cucumbers. Um, I think ever again, unfortunately. <laughs> It's just really disappointing. Um, maybe I can get like away with cucumbers at my house and then grow melons at the plot or vice versa. Um, so maybe I should consider that because that would be, I would love to make my own pickles. I do make my own pickles already, but I end up buying Kirby's from the store and then making the pickles out of those. Um, just because it's so incredibly difficult to get cucumbers to work here because of the cucumber beetle. And I think it's possible with row cover. Um, and you know what? I think that's what I'll do, actually. I forgot about that. I'm going to row cover the melons. So that way, they're not going to get hit with the beetles. I'm going to put a row cover over those, and we're going to be fine, I think, except I can't have rocks weighing things down. I think that was one of the rules. So we are going to grow these cucumbers again. I think we're going to try them here and give it a shot. Um, and I'm going to cover those for sure at my house. All right. We have watermelons, more melons, more melons. I have so many different varieties of melons, and I didn't get to taste really much of any of them. Very big disappointment. You know, but it is what it is. We have some peppers here. Artichokes, we're not doing that. We have some Jimmy Nardello seeds that we've saved over time. This is a really wonderful pepper. And I also have Carmen that I've saved over time. Another incredible pepper um, that either one of them, you would be very lucky to grow in a cooler climate. All right, here's our Sunflowers. Um, okay, here's our pink brandy wine. This is the tomato that I think is the absolute best tomato that exists. And uh, I'm sure there's something better out there, but I don't want to find out just yet. And unless someone can definitively tell me that they have something better. Uh, we have some nasturtiums. We're going to put them around the yard as we do every year. Um, it's a wonderful plant to have. This has got to go in a different pile. Um, yeah, something like that. And then the Gold Rush tomato. This is an incredibly productive tomato. Oh my goodness. But I, yeah, it's just one of them things. Don't have room for it. Don't have time for it. Um, I guess I could get away with it at my at the plot now that I think about it. That would be incredible, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, I would probably even... I would rather even do Eadley, probably, at that plot. But do I really need all these... Do I really need all of those tomatoes, though? What do I do with all these different cherry tomatoes, guys? What do you think? So I think we've got ourselves a pretty good start here. All of the cool-loving crops... Majority of them will be grown at the house. 
you know, we're already going to move the peppers around. So um, the peppers, now that I think about it, these Jimmy Nardellos will be at the community garden. We will just do this entire thing here of peppers um, and maybe even eggplant. Um, Yeah, I think we I think we can get away with that. Um, the whole big idea, though, behind the eggplant and the peppers is to get them in a raised bed and get them a lot of heat. So I think I may just create myself a raised bed at this plot, really mound up the soil and um, and work with that. The same thing with the potatoes. I'm gonna put um, I'm gonna put those in a mound, I think, as well. Um, Actually, I don't need to do that. I don't necessarily need to do that, I don't think. Well, it could benefit, but I think the potatoes are gonna get covered with that straw. Down here at the bottom, maybe we can call this the tomato patch, and maybe we can move all of our tomatoes over there. And then the rest of this is gonna just be melons, uh, I think. Unless we can somehow get cucumbers in here or melons, vice versa, as I mentioned. And that I think is gonna be it because the rest of this stuff is very difficult to grow unless you have the perfect conditions, which is the brassicas, the lettuces, the things that like the cool weather. Um, so that'll, that'll be it, guys. Um, that's sort of this video. I hope this sort of helped some people put together their garden plans for the future and uh, it's really this simple and then what I do is in the spring I pull this up on my phone open up my Google Drive app and I know exactly where everything goes everything's planned I have everything already ready to go bring it over to the plot or wherever it is that I'm gardening and then plug the things in the ground and that's it so and this was a long one guys appreciate it if you made it this far consider subscribing if you haven't Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and also our blog, figboss.com. Can't wait to show you guys the new logos and all the new merch and even the changes to that blog. We'll see you guys soon. Take care, everybody.